from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. His sweet Joey Pigsaw stories make it easier for all of us to understand kids who are different from us. His newest book, Dead End in Norvelt, is a melding of fact and fiction in a novel about a character named Jack Gantos <laughs> and set Call in Norvelt, Pennsylvania, which just happens to be the author's hometown. How much is fact and how much is fiction? I'll let him tell you. But it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you National Book Award finalist, Newbery Honor winner, and former kid who kept a journal, Jack Gantos. <laughs> so much. That was so lovely. Well, thank you for the lovely introduction. It's nice to be back here under the tent. I was here a few years ago, and I must not have done anything too horrendous, so they invited me back. I'm here, of course, because I write books. Um, it just seems to be the job that I ended up with. I'm very happy to have it. I wanted it when I was a kid. And I went out and got it. And I'm still pretty pleased with that. Here's what I thought we would do today. We have about 45 minutes together. And naturally, I have a new book. And you know, I'm pitching a new book as kind of you know, same, shameless self-promotion, which uh, I'm good at because my motto is all me all the time. So, <laughs> and it's not a surprise, really, to me, anyway, or anyone who knows me that uh, I'm the main character of this book as well. But I thought um, we should just sort of travel back a little bit into some of the other books and work our way up to Norvelt, and then we'll launch into that. So yes, I was uh, a kid that kept journals. And I kept journals um, not because I was smart enough to think of it myself. I was never quite that smart. Um, my sister, my older sister, you know those perfect, perfect older sister types, you know, you know them. Perfect grades, perfect behavior, perfect friends, perfect everything. The teachers would send home those notes with my sister. Betsy is a child with a great future. You know, I'd get the other note. Jack never pays attention, you know. And, and then my parents, when my sister would arrive, you know, it's wonder they didn't pay hail to the chief when she entered the dining room. You know, it's like, oh, she is the perfect one. What happened to him? So I carried this burden for many years. And then my mom decided to get my sister a diary. I had asked for one, but my mother, and I guess this was the wisdom of the 1950s, said to me, she said, no, I'm not getting you a diary. She said, girls get diaries and boys don't. And I thought, what do you mean? You know, why can't I get a diary? Like, what is this? And she said, no, you know, that's a girl thing. Go play in the road, you know, and <laughs> apparently that was a guy thing. So, uh, you know, I begged and begged and begged and my mother was unrelenting. She wouldn't give in to it. And so uh, I thought, well, I'll do the next best thing. I'll read my sister's diary, and <laughs> maybe I can edit it. <laughs> and this was just really, this was like a, a revelation to me, this moment. It was really a hallmark moment in my life when I went into her bedroom, and uh, you know where the diaries are always kept. They're kept in the underwear drawer. That's exactly where they're kept. I did a lot of babysitting when I was a child. And like you wouldn't even be out the driveway, you know. I'd be waving from your bedroom window. Hello, I already got the diary. Thank you very much. Found it in the underwear drawer, just as I knew it would be. You'd come home, I'd have a big smile on my face. No, no, no need to pay me. You already paid in advance. So um, I read my sister's diary cover to cover. Um, and it was uh, perplexing at first because it was singularly the most boring book I've ever read in my entire life. 
And I could not quite figure that out because I was always, you know, of course, under the assumption that the smartest person writes the best book, right? But this was not true. My sister was really smart, but her book was so dull, it really, it, it sort of lowered my IQ, you know? It's like, <laughs> because she just had it set up in a pattern, you know, like this pattern that, that, that just, I, it, it repelled interest. And that was, you know, page one, sentence number one, it's a beautiful day, I'm very happy, life is good, my friends are fine. You're like, so? And you turn the page, it's another beautiful day, my friends are happy, my life is good. And this went on in a repetitive pattern all the way through the book, and I thought, there's no help in this child. And I also thought, I can do better. And for once, I was really convinced I had it on my sister. Because we lived, we were one of those kind of families. We never bought a house. We were renters. And we always lived next door to the most psychotic people we could find. <laughs> and I used to just pull up a lawn chair in my front yard and stare at the neighbors. It was like. It was like having a drive-in right there. <laughs> and it was so unbelievable to me that my sister missed everything interesting. And so I went out to my mom again, and I renewed my effort, and I said, you know, I want a diary. And she said, no. And I said, yes. And she said, no. And by then, I was really ready to have one. So you know what to do when you're a kid. You just injure yourself in front of your parents. And, so you just crawl across the floor and find a set of stairs. Concrete will always work the best. <laughs> and then you beat you know, your frontal lobe right on the edge of a step, and you scream bloody murder. I want a diary, I want a diary, I want a diary, and shed a little blood. And when you come out of the coma, you have a stack of diaries. You have flowers. People are happy to see you. So I got one. My mother wasn't happy, but that was not my greatest concern in life. Otherwise, I'd do nothing. So I got the diary, and like all of us who are interested in writing, we're generally interested in reading. And you know the, the whole reading curve is just so fabulous, because you start early with board books, right? You're born, like your parents have you. And they pull that <coughs> lovely little thing out, that little baby, and it's right there, and they stare at it, and they go, it is so beautiful, but does it have a brain? They don't know, you know, because it doesn't read yet. So they take you home, and they prop you up on a pillow, and you fall over. This happens for about nine months. You keep going, and that's why all your photographs are like going sideways, right? And, you know, you're trying to dress up the kid in all those clothes you've received before they grow out of them, you know? And so you're dressed up like, you know, a clown for most of those nine months. And then finally the day comes when they go to test you out and they hold up, you know, the first book, a board book, an animal identification book. And they flip it to an easy page, a cow, right? Because they don't want to give you the porcupine because it's just a little too mean to give that to you. So they give you the easy one, the cow. They hold it too close to your face so that your eyes are crossed. And then they lovingly say, what does the cow say? And you, you are fighting a tough battle cross-eyed for cognition here. And finally, finally it happens and you go moo. And when you go moo, you know, you enter the world of reading. And everybody's really happy. They did a little happy dance and they call the relatives. You, you meow like a cat. You bark like a dog over the phone. People are cheering. You think reading's great. Then you do, uh, you know, you move up, you know, like brown bear, brown bear. What do you see? I see a red bird looking at me. And then they give you the hungry caterpillar, right? And you're like, whoa, that's a groundbreaking book because it's got a hole in it. And when you, as a child, when you go, oh, my God, it has a belly button. It's alive. I'm a book, too. You know, you're like, the unity is so beautiful, you know? Then you're doing hop on pop, go dog go, you know, green eggs and ham. Then you move on up, you know, all those picture books. You're doing where the wild things are. And then you read Curious George and Eloise and the Madeline books and No Kiss for Mother and George and Martha. Oh, and The Stupid Family, Don't You Love Them by Jim Marshall. And I love The Stupids Die. That's the best. 
So you do that whole string of picture books, then you move on up into those little chapter books, right? Frog and Toad, and you're like, oh, I am so reading. And then you do, you know, like the Minarak books, the Little Bear books, and you do those, and Danny the Dinosaur, you run up in there, and then you start edging into the shorter novels, No Flying in a House, James and the Giant Peach, and then you hit like a cricket in Times Square, and you're like, I love that. And then, you know, you hit Charlotte's Web, and after that, it's over. You know, you're like, You've got like a big hook in the back, you know, reader just hooked them up, you know, fished right out of there. And so, you know, you've read a lot. So when you get ready to write, you are sort of under the assumption that it's the exact process in reverse. You pull a book down from the shelf, you open it, you don't even say to yourself, read, right? It just happens. You instantly read. You open your diary, you stare at it, it stares at you. You stare at it, it stares at you. You stare at it, it stares at you. And there's like a huge disconnect at that moment. And you're like, dang, I've been tricked. And <laughs> you thought all that reading was going to help you out, but it didn't. Well, it did. You just don't know it. So I was the same way. So I'd also read Harriet the Spy. Remember Harriet the Spy? Fabulous. So my whole approach to writing from when I was a kid, like sixth grade, Harriet the Spy approach. I walked around the neighborhood. Again, the psychotic neighborhood. I did a complete map of every psychotic person in there. And I drew little pictures, and from each picture, I would start writing little stories about them. You know, Frankie Pagoda, my friend Frankie, who every day would put a ladder on the side of his house, climb up, get on his peak roof, run down the roof, dive into a swimming pool. That was how he started his afternoon. And that was going well till he missed the pool. <laughs> then he had like a dent. You could plant a little garden in there. Somebody told his older brother, who went to prison by eighth grade, but <laughs> that you could put matches out in a bucket of gasoline, which in fact you can if you're fast. Because <laughs> it's not the gas, it's not the liquid that burns, it's the fumes. You have to get the match through the fume to the liquid and put it out. But Gary, you know, he was the first kid I knew who actually went to a psychiatrist and had a tape recorder that used to say, he'd have it on, walking down the street and say, Gary, Make a good choice. <laughs> Gary, you know, think about it. He didn't like that. It's too much of a challenge for him. So he just set the whole matchbook on fire and made a torch. And went boom. He went running around the house on fire, dove in the pool, came up laughing. You know, I'm like writing this stuff down. I'm like, my sister is like missing the best stuff in life. So fortunately for me, um, I kept all those journals and diaries. I have uh, a couple hundred journals and diaries. And so when I started to write books for children, what I did is I took out all my old journals and I just raked out all the good bits and pieces and good lines and some good dialogue and a lot of memories. And I just started repatching and, and building out those stories. So it's very natural for me to, of course, write about myself. And that takes us to 1 o'clock. <laughs> I have to 1.30, right? Thank you. I never know. I get started, and I just don't know. You know, I always think every day is Sunday for me. So I did those books. Then I moved up into the Joey Pigza novels. And, and you know, there was always like a kid like Joey Pigza. Oh, thank you. And Joey, Joey's a, a character who's very active. And when I was a kid growing up, kids came in, in like levels. They were active, very active, very, very active, off the charts active. And then they got mean with that. You know, it was like unteachable, you know? And then, and then a whole bunch of other names which were ugly. And I went to 10 schools in 12 grades. So I was always like the new kid, you know? And when you come to a new school, like there's that core group of kids, you can't bust into them with dynamite, right? You know? But who's out here on the edge, the satellite kids, you know, like Pluto, you know, out here, you know, downgraded, not even a planet. They're floating around, just a chunk of ice. And 
And that's where I existed, out here on the fringe. I was a fringe kid, and all the Joeys were out on the fringe. They were fun. They were nice. They were sweet. Sure, they were active. Sure, if you hung around with them, you could get some trouble. But they were great, accepting kids. And I always knew them as my friends. I didn't think of them as troubled kids. I thought of them as great kids, you know? They were my kind of guys. And then years later, when I started going to schools and speaking in schools, teachers are tricky. They take all the Joeys and they put them right in the front row. So every school I speak in, this is like 40 schools a year, I could guarantee this. Right here, this front row, they would give them all laser pointers, pockets full of quarters, and Velcro fasteners for their shoes. And it's like, it's like I've got a little like jazz band up here, you know, like <laughs> jungle, 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 zap, 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 you know. I'm like, oh God, you are my people. I'm sorry, I wrote that book. But I love them and they're, they're just great and they're great readers and they're smart kids and they're there. And they like to see themselves in a book. And I wrote that book in the first person. So when they start reading that book, they see themselves. It's not about them, it is them. And that, you know, is that moment of empathy that we really want to enter in with a young reader and a book. We want to staple that together. I am the book. So, I know that sounds so preacherly. Now... So I did that, and then I started writing about my hometown in several ways. Um, I was uh, born in Norvelt, Pennsylvania, which is a 1934 planned community named after Eleanor Roosevelt, and I'll get to her. But before I did that, let me just tell you about this other book. This is like the town I'm from, the next door town. So I wrote that book called The Love Curse of the Rumbaws. I don't know if anybody read that, because no, most people don't, because, oh. Well, thank you. This is like Western Pennsylvania is like the Jurassic Park of America. It is just, you know, it is just so fabulous. It is the land of time forgot for behavior. And so my great uncles, Abner and Adolph Rumbaugh, I'm part Rumbaugh. So here's why you should listen to your mom. My mom is a great storyteller, and every time I drive out to Western Pennsylvania, you know, and you go through the gate to get to Western Pennsylvania, and then, <laughs> you know, she doesn't drive, so we always take her, uh, I always take her to the cemetery, you know, because that's where she loves to go, because she knows more people underground than above ground, <laughs> and as I'm driving, I give her my notebook, and we'll stop in front of a stone, and then she'll start telling a story. I'm like, write that down. Start making some notes. You know, you're telling some good stories. So we went home. We're talking, and she started talking about her relatives, the Rumbaws, and Adolph and Abner, and they had a pharmacy in, in uh, Norvelt, Pennsylvania, in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania, and she was talking about them because they were sick. She said, those boys were sick. I'm like, sick what? She said, well, when... They were born, they lived with their mother all their life. She ran their life, and they were like 65 when she died, and when she died, they didn't know what to do, so they preserved her. And I said to her, like, what, pickles? She said, no, like a deer head. I said, you must be joking, you know, because I'm thinking right away, assisted living, you know, and so... She says, she says, no. God, I'm just thinking my relatives can get this online. Um, and so, <laughs> so I said, you mean like taxidermy? She said, yes. She said that they stuffed their mother, they taxidermed their mother, and they mounted her standing on a little uh, piece of plywood that they painted like a rug with wheels on it. And, and they would wheel her around. And I'm looking at my mom like, you got to be joking. And then I thought, no, she's not joking. I'm in Western Pennsylvania. So it's like, <laughs> so that's just the flavor of the place right there. you know. So when they talk about melding fiction and truth, you know, and there's no such, there's no line. <laughs> at any rate, 
If I don't mention this book, my publisher's going to come after me. So this is Dead End in Norvelt. This book just came out last week. Oh. I'm shocked. I didn't know you all have been waiting so long, patiently, like my editor. So back to 1934. So FDR. FDR was sworn in in 1933. He came into a country where at least 25 to maybe 40 percent of the people were unemployed. And when you look at western Pennsylvania, at that time all the mines, the coal mines had closed. And all those workers were living in company houses and they were kicked out of those company houses. You had all those people working around, walking around out there with no work. You had farmers that couldn't really get it going. And you had all those factory workers that were out of work. And and who came to the rescue? Eleanor Roosevelt. She looked out at this country and she said she had to do something for those people. So they started this homestead operation where they would buy a big chunk of land. The government would buy a big chunk of land. In this case, they bought the Hearst Farm, 250 acres. They chopped it up into 250 plots. They had a community farm, community factory, community kitchen chicken hatchery. They didn't even have money. They had labor chits or, or scrip. And I would help you build your house. You would help me build my house. You'd be a plumber. You'd be an electrician. And they built this town. It was a perfect little community helping hands outfit. No, nobody walked away with the word socialist or commie, except my dad. That's later. <laughs> But it was like a helping hand town. It was just like a, what the values of the country should be, people helping people. That's the town I was born in. It was named Norvelt after Eleanor Roosevelt. And there are about 100 of these little towns scattered all over the country. There's one in West Virginia named Eleanor. But I don't get into that. I'm sticking with mine. So, this book opens up. I'll just give you some teaser sections. My father, we had, they had lived there for a while, my mom and my dad, and I was born and lived there. And my father had been in World War II. And when he left Mount Pleasant, Norvelt area, and went to the South Pacific in the Navy, he experienced war. And he came back feeling victorious. And when he came back to Norvelt, he just thought, this little helping hand town is not his slice of the pie. You know, I mean, he wanted real money. You know, he didn't want, like, labor chits. He didn't want to go around canning peaches and buying things with them. So he wanted to get out. But one of the things that he had brought home from the South Pacific was a whole chest full of Japanese war souvenirs. And so this is the great thing about being born poor. In my backyard, we had a picnic table. And about a mile away, we had a drive-in theater that I couldn't afford. But I had my dad's Japanese binoculars. And I used to stand on the picnic table in the backyard and watch movies about a mile away. And then I would make up all the dialogue and make up the story and, you know, I'd act the whole thing out as much as you can while you're holding binoculars. So it was like, it was like one of those South Pacific war movies like Wake Island or something like that. And, you know, and then it occurred to me, my dad's got all that Japanese stuff. That'll be so cool for props. So I went and I got what I shouldn't get, and that was a Japanese sniper rifle. And it had a full clip on it. And I knew the clip was off. So I was like, OK, I'm safe. So I got up on that table, and I aimed. And that thing was so long, it didn't have a scope on it. It just had that V sight with a ball. you know. And you're out there. You know, you're a kid. It's heavy. It's swinging up and down. And so I finally get it to the point where I think I got the drive-in lined up. And bam, I fired that thing off, and it actually fired. <laughs> And it blew me right off of that table. <laughs> and I have a condition. I don't have it right now, thank God. But I have a condition that when I get really, really tensed up, my nose just lets go and blood just like pours out of my nose. And right away, it was pouring. 
And I dove under that table, and I heard my mother scream in the kitchen, Jackie! And she came running out of the house, and she reached under that table and pulled me out and looked at me and went, oh, my God, you've shot yourself in the face. I was like, am I dying? She goes, let me see. So I, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, when you shoot yourself in the face, it can't be good, you know. Like, do you even want to survive? Should you just go ahead and die? So she had an apron on. She wiped my face down. And then she went, oh, it's just that dang nose of yours, you know. I was like, whew. Down the street, the ambulance came up to Miss Volker's house, and I thought, oh my God, I missed the drive in, I killed old Miss Volker. <laughs> but I didn't. She was in the bathroom, and she dropped her hearing aid in the toilet. <laughs> and the, ca the, the nice thing about Norvelt, everybody had to have like two or three jobs, and the ambulance driver was also a plumber. So, <laughs> Had to reach down in there and get her <laughs> waterlogged hearing aid. She must have thought she was underwater for some time. At any rate, I was grounded. <laughs> My mother had done some volunteer work for a library that was closing um, in Hecla, a little town just down the street. I mean, really, you could almost throw a stone at it. And, uh, they gave her a whole set of landmark biographies. And you know those old landmark biographies? God, I would read every one of them. I mean, I had enough that you could architecturally make like a little cabana in your house out of books, you know, like bricks. And I would read them, and it just occurred to me while I was, you know, grounded that I was reading history that I was very questionable. And my nose was like my conscience because like Pizarro, right? Pizarro went to Peru. He killed about a million Inca. And who's the hero? Pizarro. And like he's digging people up out of their graves, you know, stealing their gold, you know, and running off. And I'm like, wait a minute. And my nose is bleeding. I'm like, this can't be good. And then, you know, you read Cortez, you know, and Cortez goes to Mexico City, kills about a million people, steals all the gold, and he's the hero. I'm like, wait a minute, in my town, that's not how it works. It's like the people are the heroes, and the people that would come to your town would, and kill you would not be, you know, the hero. So it just seemed to me that I was getting some bizarre sense of history with this kind of conscience in my nose, not my brain, certainly, <laughs> none of that. So my dad, my dad had this scheme to get out of Norvelt. So he came home with an airplane kit. He had bought a J3, a Piper Cub J3 kit that was left over from World War II. They made a lot of them. It was a single plane. And he put it in the garage, and he built an airplane. And our house, we had enough field behind our house for growing crops because it was built on the, this is true, this is built on the Jefferson plan. And Jefferson's vision of America was every house had enough property to grow their own crops in bad times. You could always feed your family. So our fields went off, and this J3 could take off on anything. So my mom, who believed in the tithe, remember the tithe, the 10%, my mom had 10% of her farmland for the elderly that she would cook for. And she had a corn crop. And my dad said to me, cut down that corn. I said, you must be crazy. She'll kill me. He said, just cut it down. We'll get to that later. So. <laughs> I had a riding mower, which I loved a riding mower because it's like your first hot rod, you know, when you're a kid. And so I cut it down, and my mother came out. I, she was really, really mad, severely mad, and I was double grounded. So, I mean, she couldn't do much more to me than that. And then uh, the only way I could get out of doing this stuff, of staying in my room and working for her, was, well, I was just lucky. The woman down the street, Ms. Volker, she had been hired by Eleanor Roosevelt, this history, hired by Eleanor Roosevelt to be the nurse of the town. And she took that job seriously. She delivered babies, she fixed bones, she pulled teeth, she did the whole nine yards. 
and she also was the town obituary writer, which she said was their final medical report. <laughs> and she was brilliant. She wrote for the town newspaper. She always wrote the This Day in History section, and she was like a real Howard Zinn sort of lefty, you know, and she <laughs> would really rail on anything. And so when people would die, she would add like a two-page historic segment on this day in history. And it would always be leaning toward, you know, Eleanor's point of view. <laughs> so she came down with terrible arthritis. And her hands sort of got a little locked down on her. And so my mom would loan me to her as her scribe. And, I, you know, John Adams had the same thing. When later on in life, he had a scribe, too. So I was Miss Volker's scribe. And she would, when somebody would die, she would dictate the obit to me. And then I had an old royal typewriter. And I would type it up and take it down to the newspaper. And then Miss Volker had, she had a needlepoint map of the whole town on her living room wall, and when everyone, when anyone would die, she'd put a pin right in their house. So Miss Volker was getting tired of being alive, and she was also, I think, a little tired of living in Norvelt. And she was so vexed with the town because as the town grew older, they didn't even know their origins. They had lost their sort of history. And, you know, there was no longer this helping hand thing. And my mother used to take me to the doctor and still try and pay bills with cases of, like, canned vegetables, you know. And, like, the doctor would even say to my mother, look, you know, we, we got to have cash, you know. <laughs> it's not working anymore. And she would embarrass me terribly. But nonetheless... Miss Volker wanted these people to, you know, the last nine Norbelters, the original ones, to kind of die. And then she got a little help. First off, the Hell's Angels moved into our town <laughs> because one of them got run down with a cement truck on, on the road that went through. God, he was flat. And <laughs> incredible tattoos. The moment I saw him, my nose let loose. And... But I always had to accompany Miss Volker to everything. And then she had spies trying to keep an eye on the last nine. And they would call her and they'd say, I haven't seen Miss Dubicki in a few days. She hasn't been at church. We haven't seen her at the grocery store. She's not out collecting her mail. And then Miss Volker would make me put a costume on. I had a Grim Reaper costume. And I would go over to their house and open up and see if they were still alive. And I actually stuck this one woman. She was like asleep and in a barca lounger, you know, I, I, she was hard of hearing, I guess, or a deep sleeper. And I kept saying, Miss Dubicki, Miss Dubicki, Miss Dubicki. And finally, I just poked her with that side. And she hopped up and went, who are you? I said, I'm the Grim Reaper. She said, did you come to take me away? I said, I said, yes. <laughs> she said, well, can I have an extra week? I've got a birthday party to go to. I said, I can come back. And then the other thing Miss Volker allowed me to do was drive her car because she couldn't drive. And she had an old Plymouth Valiant, and I could drive around all the time. And that was great fun. So this town, you know, it's a funny thing about this town, this town in Norvell. Here it is, this great historic town, really built at a very important moment in history by somebody who was so great. Because when you think of Eleanor Roosevelt, I mean, just think of this for a moment. Who do you think? Who do you think did the first introduction for the diary, uh, Anne Frank's diary? Who? Who stood up and went, I'm going to write that introduction? Eleanor Roosevelt. You know, she was the one that championed that book. And her My Day column, seven years writing a column every day in the newspaper. My Day. And if you go out and you find that book of letters from children to Eleanor Roosevelt around Christmas time, I mean, heartbreaking letters, you know, like I noticed, I noticed that FDR got a new pair of gloves for Christmas. Can I have his old gloves? Letters like this. I mean, you see a snapshot of a country that was really crippled by poverty and hopelessness. And this woman really was quite a champion. But Miss Volker was so upset because people in the town even forgot their history. And she could not stand that. She couldn't bear it. 
And so she was always trying to teach them their history, the world history, a point of view. And so in this little tiny town, this little test tube of a town, you have those kinds of themes. Now, to extrapolate on that, if you think that you're going to lose your history, if you would think that this country could lose its history, if you think that books would disappear and we would lose history, or this festival would disappear and there would be no history of it, you would not bear up to that. You would not put up to that. Just as, as Miss Volker always said to me and taught me, she said, every person, every human being on this planet is their own volume of history, which should go on a carousel, go into a library of the world's people. Everything, it should be a growing bookshelf. And that is really how we felt about it there, that everyone had the equality of their own history, that there weren't the greats and there weren't the not so greats. There were the equals, and we love that. So even though this book, is crackers in certain ways. On other ways, it really talks about that value of history and this particular element of history right now. That town is still there. You can drive out there. It's got a little sign, name Norvelt after Eleanor Roosevelt. And I'll leave you with this, just one great thing, and then I'll leave two minutes for questions. There was one family, well, you know me, and so there's one family there was an African-American family in Western Pennsylvania that wanted to be part of the 250 families. And unfortunately, the other 249 said no. And so this is ironic, but this is truth. Her name was Mrs. White. And Mrs. White wrote a letter to Eleanor Roosevelt saying, my family needs an education. My family needs a house. We need to farm. We have a family to grow, too, like everybody else. Eleanor Roosevelt put her in a house intentionally. So when they had a contest to name the town, right? It used to be called Westmoreland Homestead. Who do you think won that contest? Mrs. White submitted the winning name, Norvelt. Is that not justice? That is so, uh, and that's what that town is all about. I love that town. Finally, I've written a lot of other books and so on and so forth, but we don't have time to go into all that today. And I did leave you two minutes. Was it two minutes? I've got five minutes. Five minutes. If anyone has any questions. Any questions at all? This is really perfect for me. <laughs> okay. Well, let me just say this. Oh, ma'am, pardon me. Could you talk a little bit about Hole in My Life in terms of the, yes. No, oh, Hole in My Life. And thank you for writing it because I'm a librarian and I have to give it to kids when they have to read autobiographies and they come back and say, this makes autobiographies cool. Thank you so much. Wow, um, thank you. <laughs> I'll give, you, I'll give you a quick capsule, a quick capsule whole of my life, but, you know, I was, I thought I was a pretty smart kid, and I, you know, I did go to high school, and I was supposed to go to college for creative writing, but somehow I didn't. I was supposed to go to University of Florida, but it was just a giant sports facility with a sort of an academic department, like a tick attached to the side of it, and I, I thought I could do that on my own, and so I didn't do that. I decided to do drug smuggling, and so... I got involved with a bunch of guys, these British guys, don't hang out with them, and, and uh, they said, look, we're looking for a nice kid. I said, I'm a nice kid. They said, well, I was living in St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. They said, we've got a 65-foot yacht with 2,000 pounds of hashish on it. Would you help sell this to, to New York, and we'll give you $10,000 in cash. Now, I was broke, and I did have morals, ethics, and values, but I just put them in a box, and I thought, <laughs> A month from now, I'll pull them back out and put them back on. And I'll have 10 grand, and I'll just go to private school. But I got arrested, and then they gave me six years in prison. And then, you know, I only did a year and a half. I paroled. And then I went right to Emerson College in Boston. I, I wrote Rotten Ralph, the first picture book. I was still on parole. Every month, I'd go down to the federal courthouse and sign in. 
I was so afraid people would find out about my prison background. Because, I mean, what school? What school? Put this in your head. What school is going to go, what, what author should we get for the kindergartners this year? <laughs> let's, get, let's get that drug smuggling ex con. <laughs> Bring him in. I'd get within 100 feet of the school, I'd be arrested. <laughs> I'm sorry, one more question. Um, what was the inspiration behind Rotten Ralph? Well, Rotten Ralph, a big red cat does rotten things. When I was in college, I decided to get a cat. And so I opened the Boston Globe. I was in Boston, and I went to the used cat section. <laughs> and it was Harvard University, Australian couple. Don't mess with them either, and <laughs> got to get rid of cat, lovely cat. I go over, I get the cat. I don't have a cat case, I just bring a towel. And I put the, <laughs> roll the cat up in the towel, like, and it's a hellion, you know it's a hellion already. I mean, it's spitting. I don't have a car, I get on the subway. <laughs> Goes around that turn, and that squealing steel wheel, still to rack, <laughs> the cat goes, and flops right over. I'm like, oh my God, the cat had a coronary. So I take it home, it revives, thank God. And so instead of, and it was just a, an evil animal. And, and so uh, instead of writing sweet, you know, like sweet picture books, you know, like I never was the fancy Nancy type anyway, you know, and so, and so uh, I just went the opposite direction. I mean, I like those books like Tommy Unger is No Kiss for Mother, The Little Brute Family, those are good books, you know. So, Harry the Dirty Dog, that's a good book, you know. So I went down that path. How am I doing? Four minutes, jeez Louise, I gotta answer another question now. Yes. Who was your inspiration for Joey Pigza? For Joey Pigza? I took guys like uh, Kenny Deal, Kenny Deal down the street, every day, every afternoon, his mother would call him to the front yard. Now, Kenny would be out there, we'd be playing football, we'd be all over the place, and Kenny Deal and his mother, the old medications were not the same. She had a big jug, it looked like a big, you know, like whiskey jug, and it had some pink sticky substance in it. And she would get a wooden soup spoon, and she'd bang that jug, and she'd say, Kenny, Kenny, it's time for your medicine. And Kenny would come home, and she'd give him two spoonfuls of this stuff, and then you'd find Kenny staggering down the street. <laughs> and, you know, like, he would land in your yard, you know, and you'd go and wake him up, Kenny, you okay? And he'd have that little pink line of drool running down into his ear. And the old medicines were just like, knock you down, you know. And whenever I tell this story, you go, teachers come up afterwards, they go, where can we get some of that? And, you know. So kids like that, I sort of mushed them all together and made a great kid. I think I'm over here, yes? Did it ever get tiring having such a crazy life? Or did you not even know it was insane until later on? <laughs> you don't know you're living a crazy life unless there's contrast. And, you know, I mean, no, there was no contrast. Uh, on Saturdays, I spent every Saturday in the Elks Club, sitting around the bar, eating, you know, salty peanuts, listening to men drink beer and tell really lurid tales. And I'm like, <laughs> This must be what life is, you know? So I was perfectly happy with my life. And the last question, ma'am, because I'm running on that overtime. Whatever happened to Betsy? Whatever happened to Betsy? My sister, I love my sister. When I turned 40 and matured finally, I, I realized that she was fabulous. And um, she now, she lived in St. Croix all these years. And she's up in Newport, Rhode Island doing a little bit of work. And she's just a great, great person. I love her. But when she reads my work, she's just like, I can't believe you're writing that. Like, my mom doesn't even allow these books in the house. <laughs> my mother thinks I only wrote Rotten Ralph and Joey Pigsa. That's it. <laughs> I'm keeping it that way. I actually have to give her a copy of this, and I'm scared to death. Because my uncle's in it, and he has a rifle, and <laughs> he's thinly veiled. 
I know. You need to get a magic marker. I know. I need a magic marker. You know what I need? I need a different book. <laughs> Finally, I think I did hit it. I hit that line. Thank you all. Thank you, National Book Festival. It's a great gig. Keep reading. I'm right with you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.